experience of grad school is not just the text and the theory and the shows you see or the you know readings that you learn. It's the experiences and the conversation and the ideas you hatch amongst your peers in that group. And so we really did view ourselves as a sort of you know co cohort of, of mad curators against the world. You know, and this was right when 9/11 happened. It was a group of 20 kids about you know, 22 to 26, I think I was 26 at the time, 25, 26, all excited to talk about art and biennials and to stage exhibitions. And then the World Trade Centers collapsed and people we know have died and we all of a sudden realized how ludicrous our life's goals were. Everything we had done to that point, all the energy we put into it, the money we saved, the loans our parents took out, all the passion and the furor and the fighting and the laughter and the joy and everything that we had had in the pubs or on the galleries or in the streets of New York or London or Berlin or wherever, didn't mean a damn. Because 35 people just got incinerated and were under attack and the movie Red Dawn is coming to life and we're sure the, the commies are going to be parachuting on the lawn of the campus any bloody second. What are we going to do? And I'm a curator? Come on. Can you imagine how insignificant and farcical we felt? It's this massive identity crisis. What the hell do we mean in the context of all this? Those were some really dismal days for the country, for the world, for the families that were affected, of course. But for you know, people that are prone to identity crisis and existential angst, it was a really, really dark and dreary time as well because we didn't know what we meant. And this is something I picked up in grad school as well. There's a guy named Viktor Frankl who survived the Holocaust. He's a psychologist. And he wrote a book called The Doctor and the Soul. And in The Doctor and the Soul, he addresses this very issue of how do we reconcile our worth as individuals, as humans on this planet in the face of evil incarnate of such magnitude. And he puts it in terms of what we have a will to be. And there are those that have the will to power. Those individuals often aspire to political office or civic leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's the will to influence. It would also be politics, but also be you know, financiers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's the will for wealth, piling up masses and masses and piles of cash in order to, to have lovely lives. Nothing wrong with that, as far as I'm concerned. As long as you give it to the arts in a substantial degree. Make sure. And then there's what Frankel terms the will to meaning. And he categorizes that as individuals who at their core foundation are driven by a will to mean something of significance. That their meaning, their self-worth, their value as a human existing in the world has to do with they feel satisfied that their work, that their life's actions, that their belief systems, that their daily day routines are contributing towards this overarching meaning. And among the first that Frankel categorizes as embodying that pursuit are artists. Artists are fundamentally motivated by a will to meaning according to Frankel, but also according to me. So if you want to credit me, you can do that. But, you know, little footnote, Victor Frankel, Doctor and Saul, circa 1963. So we're reading all this stuff, and we're talking amongst our peers, and we're seriously, you know, at one point, I shaved my head. Not much different than it is now, but I literally took a razor and shaved my head, and I was going to join the Marines. I was like, God damn it. I was pissed off and sad and scared and like mad at myself for even thinking that art was something of value to the world when we had this terrorist evil, the devil coming to eat us kind of thing happening. I'm gonna hold a paintbrush. 
or a book of Kant? Come on. So I'm having this, this really tough life decision moment again, and then my dad comes back into the picture. He's actually always been in the picture. He's a lovely man, by the way. I just want to be sure to clear that up. He's my idol. He's my absolute hero in life. And I'm having this conversation with my dad. I'm saying, Dad, I'm considering quitting this and, and joining the military. I was that freaked out. I didn't go to classes. I was just, what the hell am I doing? And he said, John, don't you realize that what you're hoping to be able to do as you finish this program and as you matriculate into your career will be of incredible worth to your society at large once you get to do what you want to do because you're informing the world that culture counts and that art matters and that it's not because it's pretty or it's expensive or it makes our life a distraction from the horrors of the world. It's because art matters, because it teaches us why we matter as human beings. It tells us that it's not just about eating and sleeping and shitting and dying, is that there is meaning to us and that we express it through art and we tell future generations and other cultures why we believe it's worth giving a damn to live and make art because we're figuring out what the hell we're doing here and why it's okay to be scared and to be sad and to be crazy and to take risks and to be bold and why you have to be courageous in the face of all this awful. My dad probably didn't say it just like that. I probably extrapolated over the years. I tend to imagine things. But in a nutshell, again, he got me on track in a manner of speaking. And this side, and this time he had reversed side and it encouraged me to be the crazy artist. And I'll never, I'll never be able to thank him enough for that. 